Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Joe, what are this week's games? Up first is 2019's Sayonara Wild Hearts, a pop album music video in the form of a video game that makes an impact through its incredibly stylistic visuals and soundtrack. Following that is the original 3D planetary platformer on Wii, with one of the best orchestral soundtracks that Nintendo has ever produced, 2007's Super Mario Galaxy. Yes, it is all about the celestial beings this time around. Uh, whether it's all the the tarot in Sayonara Wild Hearts, and you also have the signs of the Zodiac for its achievements. But then in Super Mario Galaxy, it's all about planets, galaxies, Rosalina as a celestial being. <laughs> so I think it, it works, but these are oh, two amazing soundtracks. So glad we get to talk about them this week. Joe, how are you doing? What are you playing? I'm doing pretty all right. Uh, I've actually played quite a bit since last we spoke. Didn't and haven't like finished much since last time, but I did finish Spirit Fair. It's very good, but it's really not going to be a lot of people's cup of tea. It has no interest in getting anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Like it's very slow paced uh, and uh, very tedious. In fact, right before we recorded, and this might be out by the time this episode comes out. I'm actually editing a video about Spirit Fair right now for Nintendo World Report. But otherwise, I mean, I played Raji, a little bit of Raji. It's all right. I'm going to get back to it eventually. And I bought an Xbox. <laughs> Mainly on paper, I bought an Xbox so that I was going to be able to play Banjo-Tooie for Smash Pieces, which is our next game after the one we're currently on. There was no urgency to wait for like an Xbox Series S. Uh, that was going to come out too late for us to get there, honestly. Mm -hmm. But also, just like, I don't have a lot of interest. Even now, I still don't have a lot of interest in in, Xbox, in buying a Series X or a Series S. Though, the price point they announced? Okay. that It becomes more of a thought now, a little bit, for the S. But for now, I could just shift Game Pass onto it. And so, my roommate and I started playing Man of Medan... And uh, it sure is a video game that the people that Until Dawn made. I won't elaborate on that quite yet. It's sure, it sure exists. <laughs> I have that game and I still haven't fired it up because, yeah, I've heard similar things. <laughs> I've also been playing a lot of Xbox this week, actually. Uh, I started and beat Battletoads in one sitting. It was, it was a fun enough time to play on easy. I wasn't about to... Make it so difficult that the original Battletoads was... No, I, I, don't, I don't need that. Um, Yeah, wow. It kind of comes across... I got a bit like Newgrounds vibe feel from its animation. I don't know if that's like a knock or anything, but it, it had a lot of self-referential humor. Like, hey, it's been a long time, right? And, right, Battletoads, we're back! <laughs> and it's, it's just... It tries a lot of different things, which I appreciate that it wasn't all beat-em-ups all the time. Uh, but it just wasn't great. Uh, good to see David Housen, of course, on the music for that, as we've mentioned. And then I just started Control just before we hey. started recording. I am trying to find Marshall in the research area. So it's a good time so far. Oh, another one of those ones where it's like they start you with the same difficulty. And I'm like, oh, no, this, is, this might be too hard. And it's like, oh, thank you settings to bring down that difficulty through a variety Wait, of means did they add that that wasn't there when i played the game oh man i'm gonna have to go back to control <laughs> yeah there are options for like enhanced aim uh there are sliders for the damage jesse takes the recharge time on energy and the recharge time on ammo oh i'm gonna have to go look at control again yeah oh man so this is, I guess, the benefit of playing it a little bit later than usual. <laughs> well, let's talk about some composer follow-up news. 
the composers that we've talked about on this show, they're still working. They're still doing cool things and headlines sometimes get made in the video game industry and these composers are tied to them. It is the anniversary of Undertale coming up. Not just any anniversary, the five-year anniversary on September 15th. And Toby Fox announced that Fangamer and 8-4 are helping host an orchestral concert of Undertale music. It'll be streamed for free on September 15th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time or 7 Pacific. Details are at Undertale.com. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to something like this. I don't know if I'll be able to catch it live. I might. Honestly, 9 p.m. I'm up. Why not? Uh, that sounds really fun. I wish it was something that people could go to and watch live, but obviously that's not the world we live in anymore. In other news, The Unfinished Swan, the game we talked about for the work that Joel Corlett did on it, uh, it is now available on PC and iOS. So you can go throw globs of paint to your heart's content now on PC and your iPhone, I suppose. Apple Arcade, is it on Apple Arcade? If it's on iOS, I kind of assume probably. Probably, I would imagine so. Didn't, didn't follow up and check that there. But Annapurna Interactive is releasing a Deluxe Limited Edition Collection through IM8 Bit. It's $200 of physical PS4 copies of eight Annapurna published games. A couple of these include What Remains of Edith Finch, which we've talked about on the show before, and this week's game that Joe's bringing up, Sayonara Wild Hearts. Honestly, if I had $200 sitting around, I'd probably buy this. Uh, it's the first time that Goragoa and Telling Lies have gotten a physical release in any way. Uh, it includes, like, Donut County and the Outer Wilds. And just, it seems like a pretty neat collection. Unfortunately, Florence is not one of the games, but I would assume it's because that game would not, like, the amount of money they would have to put to print that 45-minute game on a on a disc <laughs> is probably not super worth the cost. As much as I love that game, it's justifiable. Meanwhile, Coffee Talk, according to the composer Andrew Jeremy, they are currently uh, putting into beta a new feature that will allow you to add a favorites playlist in-game. Uh, like I mentioned during the episode, you control the music of the game via an in-game phone, and now you can make playlists of your favorite songs. And also, as he showed in the video, he's just adding a bunch new tracks. Like a bunch of them. So that's that's very cool. Coffee Talk getting more music. Definitely looking forward to hearing what that sounds like. It sounds like another benefit of waiting to play certain <laughs> games. Hmm. Very interesting. So, let's uh, hop on our motorcycle and drive on over to our first game being Sayonara Wild Hearts which was originally released on September 19th, 2019 for PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, iOS, and Mac, which is why I'm bringing it this week specifically. We are, this week, gonna hit its one-year anniversary of being out. Hmm. That's pretty neat. Releases would also then follow on Windows on December 12th, 2019, and Xbox One on February 25th, 2020. It was developed by Swedish studio Simogo, and published by Annapurna Interactive. And so, Sayonara Wild Hearts is a rhythm game that is described by the creators as a, quote, pop album video game. Uh, basically, if I had to explain it, uh, it's a set of music videos that you play, pretty much. Uh, you zoom through different tracks, be it on a motorcycle or in a car or on foot, all sorts of stuff. Like that, uh, you pick up hearts as you go. At points, you will need to do more traditional rhythm inputs, where it'll, like, show a button above your head. Not, like, a specific button. While writing on the outline, I realized this game's really hard to put into words. <laughs> hmm. But it's essentially, it gives you, like, a circle, and it has a thing closed into it, and you gotta press it in time with the music, etc., etc., and all of this is set to a very distinct art style that honestly really, really makes everything pop. It's such a good-looking game. But I really don't think words 
do this game justice, like in any way, shape, or form. So honestly, just go play it, or if you really have to, go look up a video of one level, and then go play it. Uh, it's it's really, really good. So I can't describe the story better than Wikipedia can, to be perfectly honest, because it's kind of an abstract story in a lot of ways. Hmm. But here is how Wikipedia sums it up. Quote, In an alternate universe, watched over by three divine arcana of the Tarot, the High Priestess, the Hierophant, and the Empress, a cursed arcana named Little Death and her allies, the Dancing Devils, the Howling Moons, the Stereo Lovers, and Hermit 64, stole all harmony and hid it in their hearts. Before the divine arcana began to fade, they created a heroine from the shards of a broken heart. In a time near the present, there is a young woman whose heart has been violently broken. The heroine the divine arcana created transforms into a butterfly and flies to the young woman who is resting in bed. The butterfly transports her to the alternate universe, riding her longboard along an ethereal highway. She chases the butterfly, and upon capturing it, she transforms into a masked heroine, the Fool. As the Fool, she must defeat the evil arcana and restore balance to the universe. So, Peter, this is where I will ask you, what are our experiences with Sayonara Wild Hearts? Played it. Loved it. Uh, It's a very short game. Like between one and two hours to go through the whole thing so uh, it's really not a big time investment if that's any concern for anyone but yeah certainly one of the best soundtracks of last year i believe it got number three on our best of 2019 soundtrack so i think that attests to how good the quality is for these tracks that we'll hear and it was interesting for me when I was helping to teach my girlfriend how to play modern console games. And just like, this is where video games are at, not just uh, on the phone. And so I tried to think like, all right, let's start with something very easy with like touch controls like Erica. And it tells the story and it has minimal touch input. And then for me, Sayonara Wild Hearts was the next step of like introducing a controller that may seem scary like a PlayStation 4 controller, but just saying, you only have to move this left stick and press this X button. That's all you have to do. And she loves this game. It's one of these games where it's like, it's easy to play, it's easy to get through, but if you're trying to score chase for some of these bronze, silver, gold, you know, sort of medals on each level, that gets really difficult. Uh, yeah, just a very stylish game, great soundtrack, and I'm really glad we're finally getting to talk about it. Yeah, I uh, was was desperately trying to find any excuse to bring this to the table, and uh, eventually, like I said, just fell to, well, when did it come out? All right, when's the year anniversary? We're talking about it that week. I first became aware of this game when I played it at E3, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went to... E3, and we had our Annapurna appointment, and that is where I also learned that Florence and Edith Finch were coming to Switch, and then couldn't tell anybody about either of those games. Florence, I couldn't tell anybody about for like a year. That was weird. It was less than a year, but it was like six months. But still, it was a long time. And we played the first sort of quote-unquote chapter, so from the beginning to the first battle. Mm Mm-hmm. And had it had me immediately. It had me immediately. Uh, same with our friend Matt. From there, it was like, so when is this game coming out? And until it did actually release, it was a lot of like, well, we'll let you know. And so when I did finally sit down and play the whole thing, I have probably now played it like five or six times since it came out a year ago. Mm. Uh, and I don't do that with games, like ever. I don't replay games that that rapidly. But it's just a game that I enjoy going back to all the time. I also had a very similar experience uh, to you teaching your girlfriend, uh, easing her in using this game. It wasn't it wasn't the exact same thing, but I I showed this to my cousin who doesn't play video games at all. Like she doesn't she doesn't touch them, and she played up to the first battle once more, uh, and she enjoyed what she 
played, but we didn't have time to go further. So hopefully one of these days I'll be able to just like really, really get her into that because it seems like she would really enjoy it. It's just a really good game, honestly. Like you said, it's short. You can beat it in, I'd say, probably around an hour to an hour and a half at the most, depending on your skill level and how much you want to put into different levels to get the scores. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's just really great, and I enjoyed learning about how it was made. So let me tell you about some of the things that I learned. I learned that this is Samogo's eighth game. The first one of theirs that I had ever heard of, though apparently they did they they had a few successful titles before. Like I mentioned, Samogo is based out of Sweden. Their previous titles were games for mobile platforms mostly, though some of them had been ported to things like the Wii U. Uh, they started with a game called Cosmospin in 2010, so they've been around for about a decade at this point. They wanted to make a game that was a little more gut than brain, is the way they described it. And so they began brainstorming, and eventually they ended up with a sketch of a woman wearing a mask who was specifically inspired by teddy girls. Now, I didn't know what teddy girls meant, so I went (laughs) on a small little journey, and apparently the teddy girl fad was a fashion trend in the UK in the 1950s that was based around, quote, rejecting post-war austerity. Uh, I was gonna like list these are the clothes that teddy girls would usually wear and then it was a list of like 15 different articles of clothing (laughs) (laughs) so i was like i'm not just gonna list all of that on there basically as far as i could tell it was people wearing clothes that were not the usual for the time essentially uh the beatles apparently built into the fad a lot when they were first starting out stuff like that so eventually the idea spread into having a motorcycle and then it spread even further into involving the tarot arcana. And then it spread even further into traveling through a dreamscape. And from there, Cyanar wild hearts took around four years to develop starting in 2015. Officially Uh, the name they said was actually decided very early and they were specifically inspired by the story of how final fantasy got its title or the, the myth of how final fantasy got its title. Uh, Apparently that myth might not be true, but if you're unaware of that, the myth behind that title is that Square was about to go out of, like, bankrupt because none of their games had been successes, and so they called the game Final Fantasy because if this game failed, the company was going away. This was the last title, essentially, that they potentially might make. So Samogo channeled that energy, not in a way of like, if this game's not a success, we're done. But for them, it was more, we want to show that we are putting all we have into this game and we are going to make it as if it could be our last game. It probably won't be, but that's the mindset we're going to go in on. Like if we're going to go out, this is, it's going to be like with a bang. The original idea for the game, which the final product involves a lot of pop music, it's a pop album, but the original idea was not pop. It was surf rock. (laughs) Uh, Specifically, quote, some fusion of surf rock and taiko drums. Oh my gosh. (laughs) But then while they were making a prototype, uh, they happened to be listening to a pop playlist and they realized that that was the actual tone that they wanted for the game. And so their composers started working on a pop album instead of the surf rock (laughs) concept. Yeah. If it was something like the music we've heard in a monster prom, that would not work nearly as well. That's exactly where my mind went. (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine? Oh, I kind of want to see how that game would have turned out. I'm not going to lie. They also got to thinking about how games had become increasingly advanced and uninviting to inexperienced players, such as your girlfriend, my cousin, (laughs) uh, and decided they wanted to make a game that would be just as inviting to them as it would to the people who were like the developers who really loved old school arcade titles. Uh, And for this reason, that's why the controls are so simple. You only need an analog stick and a single button, and nothing more is ever required of you. 
So yeah, that was that was written into the concept from minute one. Totally perfect. They nailed it. Uh, and while one might expect something like the endless runner genre to be the inspiration for the game, I guess that's something they get asked about a lot. If like Cannibalt and, and Temple Run and that kind of thing were, were their inspirations, apparently not. The developers say they were actually uh, looking at rail shooters like Star Fox hmm. for the most part, because they featured a mix of moving and shooting as their core gameplay. Uh, but they also cited games like WarioWare. Outrun, I can definitely 100% see where the Outrun would have gone. And uh, Osu Tateke Oendan as inspirations. Sure, I, I can see the last couple, but WarioWare? I don't know. WarioWare kind of makes sense. Uh, I mean, since you're going rapidly between different sort of styles. Oh, okay, okay. Because in one section you're a first person, and in another section you're like bouncing on mushrooms. Man, that level's weird. Oh, <laughs> that was tough. <laughs> I could sort of see it, I suppose. But yeah, Outrun and, and Osu are the two, like, yeah, for sure you can see that. Outrun especially. That scene in the desert with the car <laughs> is 100% Outrun. And then you get the rhythm gameplay of an away and done, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at one point, they also had planned sections where the player would be able to freely walk around in third person to solve puzzles. But then they realized that this kind of slowed the game's pace down to a, like, crawl. So they cut this feature out. Probably for the best, I'd say. Also good when it comes to introducing new players. You don't necessarily need to throw puzzles in the mix. Yeah. And the game was officially announced at the Game Awards in 2018. So my favorite fact about this game's development, near the end of development, director Simon Flesser was casually talking with contacts at Annapurna Interactive about how they really wished they could get somebody unexpected to be the game's narrator. When they asked, like, who, what would, uh, what would you consider to be unexpected? In a non-serious way, he threw out Queen Latifah. Or like somebody like that, you know, uh, and then he's just sort of forgot about the request. He didn't expect anything to come out of it. And then a few weeks later, one month before the game was set to release, they were informed that Annapurna had managed to snag Queen Latifah for the role and the recording session was scheduled for the next day. <laughs> That's perfect. Which means that when I played this game at E3, Queen Latifah was not only not in the game yet, she wasn't even planned to be in the game. <laughs> that is nuts to think about, actually. Uh, and that's one of the, the big reveals at the end of the game, where the last thing you see in the credits is, oh, and thank you, Queen Latifah, for being the narrator. <laughs> and most people respond with, wait, hold on, what? <laughs> it's kind of a familiar voice throughout the game, but you can't easily peg it. And then it's like suddenly it all comes together. Yeah, you, you kind of immediately realize exactly uh, who it is. Huh. So I found that a lot of fun. One month before the game came out. Ugh. Obviously, the game was received very well upon release. Uh, its highest Metacritic score is an 88 on iOS, with its lowest being an 84 on both Switch and PS4. It has an 85 on Xbox. Most of the praise was, as one would expect, given to the visuals and the soundtrack uh, managed to take him a few awards during award season. The these names for this first one are something: the A Train Award for Best Mobile Game and the Tin Pan Alley Award for Best Music in a Game at the New York Game Awards, which is another award show I've never heard of. I've heard of that one. It's not a big one, but it's heard of it. Hmm. Uh, Portable Game of the Year at Dice. Uh, Best International Mobile Game at the Pegasus Awards 2020, Artistic Achievement at the BAFTAs, and Outstanding Design and Innovation at the Apple Design Awards. But it was also nominated for way more awards than that, including at shows like the Game Critics Awards, Golden Joystick, Titanium Awards, the Game Awards, Pocket Gamer Mobile Games Awards, Guild of Music Supervisors Awards, the Navigator Awards, GDC, and South by Southwest. Uh, it didn't win anything at any of those shows, but it was nominated for quite a bit. 
and many publications also named it among their Game of the Year contenders. It's interesting that you mentioned the Apple Design Awards. I even remember Sayonara Wild Hearts being on stage at an Apple conference. Like, showing off, like, here are some of the new mobile games that you can play. It might have even been for Apple Arcade uh, to promote that, yeah. I believe this was one of the headliners for when Apple Arcade launched. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was pretty much everywhere last year. I feel like it was one that got a lot of attention and yet at the same time kind of felt like it was overshadowed by a lot of bigger titles. Mm, Fair. It, It fell in that sort of small niche where it was the higher end of success for indies, but also uh, it was going to get buried by a bunch of other stuff. So, unfortunate, but that's how it is. So, a majority of the music for Sayonara Wild Hearts was done by one Daniel Olsen, which that might be pronounced differently, I don't know. Uh, It's got an accent on the E, but I assume I'm saying it right, I think. His website doesn't give a ton of information on his early life, but it does give a little bit. It says that he has been a major fan of video games since he was a child, and he even started working alongside a friend to make his own games in 1995. Uh, And this is around the time that he started tinkering with making music for games using the software ProTracker. He says that they, quote, created many games, although few were completed. Same, bud. Same. Uh, He got a job as a concept and 3D artist at Massive Entertainment, which is nowadays one of Ubisoft's many, many, many studios. Uh, He got a job there in 2001, and he has since left Massive, obviously. But also, he shifted away from doing art. Now he is completely in on sound design and music composition for games. I wonder if he got to work on the original Division, then. Depends on when he left. Uh, I'm not sure when he would have left. That's a good question. It didn't, it didn't mention, it only mentioned when he started and then it says, and then he left. Uh, <laughs> well, it probably would have been in pre-production anyway. Cause if production on Sayonara started 2015, division came out 2016, eh, who knows? Yeah. Potentially. I think at that point he had already moved to Samogo cause he did one of their other games that was before Sayonara. Mm -hmm. I found a quote on his site that I really liked, actually, which was, quote, Part of what I love about writing music for games is the challenge. You constantly have to extend your comfort zone to create something that fits with the game. My background is in chiptunes, electronica, breakbeat, drum and bass, noise, and general sound creation. Today, I have expanded to other territories like orchestral, big band, jazz, indie pop, surf, toy, rock, hip-hop, and whatnot. Generally, I just try to find things that are fun to mix together. And you can find him on Twitter at Olsefaken. That's O-L-S-E-F-A-E-K-E-N. For his discography, um, I don't really recognize any of these games. I recognize one of the names, but he lists every game he's worked on on his website, which you'd think wouldn't be a notable thing, but sometimes that's harder to find than you'd think. But the games he lists there are Experiment 13, Ilomilo, Alpha Zero, Year Walk, Device 6, The Sensational December Machine, Pop-Up Pilgrims, The Gardens Between, and Sayonara Wild Hearts, which Year Walk I know is another Simogo game. And I think Device 6 is as well. Did you know that Ilo Milo is also the name of a Billie Eilish song? Because that was the game title I recognize and now seeing it on the Xbox website. Yep, like that sure is that game. But just typing in Ilo Milo, it's like, oh, do you mean by Billie Eilish? No. (laughs) I did not know that, actually. The one I recognize is I think I saw it on Game Pass is The Gardens Between. That name sounds familiar Mm, in some way. Yeah, it was a recent indie game, I think. Yeah, it was like on, it was like the kind of funny showcase, or whatever. That sounds familiar. Interesting. That yeah, that's the that's the one I recognized. So, in terms of Sinar Wild Hearts itself, Daniel Olson did a majority of the composition on the soundtrack, but the vocal tracks were co-composed by Jonathan Ang. As far as I can tell, I think he wrote the lyrics. I tried to find some 
like elaboration on that, but I couldn't really. Uh, and the vocals were done by Linnea Olson. That's O L S S O N, non related to Daniel Olson. One of the first songs in the game is actually Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune, making this the second game within a month that we have talked about that features Claire de Lune. Artists cited as inspiration for the soundtrack were Sia, Churches, and Carly Ray Jepsen. You can definitely hear those, no problem. And in mm-hmm. fact, let's hear what those inspirations turned into with our five critical tracks, starting with critical track number one, Sayonara, Wild Heart. This is the title screen of the game, uh, and honestly, it's a really good introduction to the game's tone in general. Uh, coming in off of that opening cutscene, it's got the uh, the prismatic colors of the main menu that are really, honestly, kind of highlighted by this song, and the heart you have that's beating in time with the the kick drum, and it's a uh, this is a really really good song and a great introduction to the whole thing in general. It's one of those opening title screens that you don't want to skip because the music is so good and you want it to linger on there a little bit. And uh, hopefully you have a good sound system or you're wearing headphones while playing because, yeah, that bass kicks. Oh, yeah. The lyrics of the the songs in this game are so good. And, and some of them I, I'm just going to point out. This one's not like... Man, look how deep this is. But it's just really fun to sing the goodbye so long. It's just, it's so good. It's such a good song. But it gets even better with critical track number two. It's Begin Again. This is the theme for the Dancing Devils battle. This is the first level that was made for the game, actually, in development. Uh, wow. If the game does not have you by this point, the game's not going to get you. This is this is the moment. This is the exact moment where, when playing at E3, this is the time when I was like, oh, oh no, this game's amazing. And just... All of the imagery during this level and them like cracking the ground during the the chorus. Oh, it's so good. This level rules. This song rules. This is the moment you know that Sayonara Wild Hearts is something special. And this was also the one that they showed at that Apple conference. It makes total sense that it's the first song they created because they must have play tested this over and over and over again to get it exactly right and to have everything sync up with the music and what's going on in game. Uh, it's the perfect vertical slice of what this game is. And if there was one song we had to pick to highlight the game, it would be this one. Uh, one line that really, really stands out to me in this song. Uh, you can't hear it in the clip because it's it's much later in the song during a, a part that's not as indicative of the song than the rest of it. But I always really gravitate towards the line, it's not that I don't care, but I just cannot bear one more of those calls where I talk and you say nothing at all. I don't know, that one line has always sort of struck me very hard. Begin again! Oh, it's so good. The opening is (laughs) so good. Ah, Speaking of so good, let's get to critical check number three. Mine.
This is the music for the Stereo Lovers Battle. Uh, this is the second level that was designed for the game, I learned. Uh, the first attempt was apparently completely scrapped and started from scratch, with the initial concept for the level apparently involving driving into a castle where then you'd get the ability to clone yourself, and then you would chase the lovers through the hallway, controlling both fools at once? Hmm. Which sounds maddening. Cool, but maddening. Probably for the best that they scrapped it, because I think visually what they ended up with, it's probably the most visually cool level in the entire game. <laughs> what with the giant swords flying all around. I think it's one of the best levels. Uh, and just, I really like that this song kind of has a more upbeat vibe to it than most other songs on the soundtrack. Like, this one's just genuinely very happy sounding. The lyrics are a little bit frightening, but, <laughs> but like, in general, the song sounds really, really fun. And I dig that a lot. This is my favorite song on the soundtrack. And as you said, like that beat in the chorus, or even the mm -bam, bam, bam, ba -da -da, like it's just, yeah, happy, great energy. Uh, it's, it really goes well. I, I agree where Begin Again is like the perfect distillation of what this game is. But whenever I hear this song, like I just perk up. It's, it's great. For my favorite song in the game, let's head to critical track number four. It's inside. Like I said, this is my personal favorite song in the game. It plays during the Little Death Battle. And I just really dig the vibe that the song throws down. Uh, it starting with the dun 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 One thing that I really enjoy is that I mentioned that Carly Rae Jepsen was listed as an inspiration for the soundtrack. She's actually referenced in this song. Hmm. As well as Charlie D'Amelio. The, the lyrics, which... They had to, like, post on Instagram because people kept asking them what this part of the song actually said. Uh, and it's, and it's late night, and it's Game Boys, and it's too bright, and it's synth noise, and it's Charlie and it's milkshakes, and it's Carly and it's heartbreaks. So that is blatantly referencing both of those artists. It's such a good song. <laughs> uh, weird level. Especially the puke part <laughs> that part's a little odd yeah, yeah but otherwise it's a very cool fun level to play and a great song to go alongside it yeah and the thumping bass like really relentless in the chorus it's to go with the puke <laughs> there's a section i think right before that section in the song where the lyrics are and I had to like look up the lyrics to be sure, but they're they're so well done because they're meant to be the singer like stumbling over her words, trying to like ask a question that she can't quite form correctly because that's what the song is about. It's I want to ask you something, but I don't know how to word it, and all of the all of it stays on the inside because I can't get it out. Uh, it's just a very very good song. But it's time to end things with our critical track number five, Wild Hearts Never Die. This is the music for the finale. 
it is a very close second for my favorite song of the game. Probably tied with Begin Again, if I had to really put it down to it. But this song makes me really, really emotional. I can't even begin to explain how emotional I get listening to this song, but it's it's so, so good. I have one criticism for this song, and it's that it's way too short. One uh, piece of lyric that I really, really enjoy from this song is, Bring a thousand blades, we won't feel the sting. Our love shines bright, but then everything fades to black. Names roll by like a movie. No way back. Come on, who are we fooling? Oh, sorry. Come on, who I'll be fooling. There you go. There you go. You got to have some energy. <laughs> like you're reading it. And I'm just thinking of it in in song the whole time. No, it's such a good finale. And it really completes the hero's journey or the heroine's journey in this case. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I, another one that just puts a smile on my face. The whole sequence is just so good. It's such a good sequence. There is a mix on the official soundtrack release that is... Because this is actually like a third of an entire level, this song. Oh, the, yeah. The finale is so long. There's a mix on the official soundtrack release that mixes all four songs together into one coherent piece. And it's just really cool to listen to. It's a really, really great song. I absolutely adore this song. So, for tracks on the cutting room floor, you got two. Hit me up. This one is the only non-vocal piece on our lists, so to speak. This one is called Parallel Universes. And if you ever liked those levels of platformers where like red and blue platforms shift back and forth over time, or even that level in Titanfall 2 where there are two realities that get switched back and forth on the fly, uh, you'll like this level, the parallel universes levels where the heroine is facing the stereo lovers, and they are changing two levels, two realities, dimensions? Back and forth, uh, and it starts slower, but it's like ultimately on every beat at the end is bop, 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 bop. <laughs> Eventually it becomes three universes, I think. Oh, jeez. Uh, that they switch between, because it's like dun, 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 dun. Uh, it's, it's a really cool level. It is my least favorite level to play. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. It's tricky for sure. I found out that it was actually the last level that was made for the game. Uh, they really only added it because they wanted one more level before they started playtesting. That is interesting to know. Yeah, it's, it's a totally different, unique idea. And, and the rhythm of this one almost feels like basketball-like, if that makes sense. Like, uh, the boom, the da, ba -doom, ba -doom. I just kind of gives, like, gives me that sort of feeling in it. I don't know. The other one I wanted to highlight on the cutting room floor is... The world we knew. Man, you just bring it back to that. I'm too young to remember. And it's just like, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, would you guess that this is a boss battle? You're against Hermit64 in this one, and you're going all around like a, a virtual reality headset. You're doing a lot of like 2D spaceship-like shooting. I don't know. It's a, it's a fun level. It's a fun boss. But this relaxing, just calming piece doesn't really fit, but in a way it totally does. It's kind of a nice little break 
mm, mm. after all of the high high energy high paced stuff before it like it just it's a nice little it's kind of a relaxing boss fight almost it's my personal bottom tier boss fight but that is not to say that it is bad because i don't think any part of this game is bad <laughs> For me, I also have two tracks. The first one is Dead of Night. This is the music for the Howling Moons battle. And uh, look, that chorus, man, I am not a huge fan of the first person view stuff in this level overall. I think dodging those trees in first person gets a little bit much, mm -hmm. but it completely makes up for it. The instant that chorus hits oh, and you're yeah. like flipping over the wolf mech and oh, it's such a cool sequence. Yeah, and the music just really emphasizes it, like the full instruments coming in. Oh, it's such a cool drop. I I really like this song. This is a this is a neat song. And then for a song that I don't think gets highlighted nearly as much as it kind of deserves, my second track on the cutting room floor is a place I don't know. I was used to my This is the music for the credits. Uh, it's a completely different tone from the rest of the soundtrack, obviously, uh, going away from sort of pop into like this acoustic guitar, very hopeful, but also very quiet piece. And it's just a very calm moment of reflection for the experience that you just had in general. And I really, really, really like this song, especially for when, again, you're listening to that big sort of mix down of all of the final level music on the soundtrack and it ends on this. It's just, it really gets you, man. I like this song a lot. It does. And you're right. Not a lot of people give it the credit that it deserves. It's, it's really nice. I wish we could have included the whole like section of it in the clip because... I, at the end of the clip, it's, you know, it took me to a place I didn't know or whatever it was. This, I think, is the second verse you used for the clip. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's so calming. It's so peaceful. And I forgot about it until now, to be honest. It's got another lyric that usually, like, kind of just strikes a chord with me. Uh, it's the very first lyric in the entire song, actually, which is, what's the word? Does that thing have a name? when familiar surroundings just don't look the same. I really like that that line a lot. It's very good. So what will I never forget about the game? I think I would be lying if I didn't say that it was. it might actually be among my favorite games ever now. Like, again, I've played it like four or five, maybe six times since it came out, and I don't ever do that. I'd never do that. <laughs> Usually if I replay a game, I give it like a couple years of space before I do so. But this one, I just keep going back to it and I keep playing it. And there has to be a reason for that. And it, I think it's just because it's just a very, very well put together game. If you haven't already, you should go play Sayonara Wild Hearts. It is 100% worth your time. Yeah, I mean, my girlfriend and I revisit now and again every every so often just to play certain levels and oh, we can do that boss battle with the wolves. Yeah, sure, we can definitely do that. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's so fun. It's so fun and like great messaging, great theming throughout the whole thing, great storytelling. Uh, man, I don't think that game got enough credit last year in 2019 on all fronts. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it deserved a lot more attention, even more attention than it got, because it did get a good amount of attention for an indie game, honestly. Uh, and I hope that if you haven't played it, this episode has turned you around on the, the fact that you should 
go give it a shot. So with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and transition to our next game. But to help with that transition, I found an 8-bit mix of the song Transonic Gravity, which is another one of those... If we had one more slot on the cutting room floor, I think Transonic Gravity probably would have gone on there for me. It's mm-hmm. such a good song. Uh, this is a Transonic Gravity dual mix in 8-bit by the YouTuber 40 Nix. That's 40 N-I-X. So please enjoy that, and we will be right back. Yeah, that one's pretty cool. I don't know if you went back and heard, but the left channel is that 8-bit remix, and then the right channel is the original version of the song. So you could have a dual mix. That's really, really cool. Let's talk about Super Mario Galaxy! Ba 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 da ba ba! <laughs> oh, such a good game. Took so long to finally get to talking about Super Mario Galaxy, but here it is, and for one of the best reasons, let's be honest. Super Mario Galaxy was released on November 1st, 2007 in Japan on Nintendo Wii. North America got the game on November 12th, Europe on November 16th, and Australia on November 29th. All major regions within a month, that's pretty good. For Nintendo Wii in a time where PAL versions usually got screwed with those games for localization. In fact, the game actually got even released in South Korea, but it was titled there as Super Mario Wii. And that was released there on September 4th, 2008. Oh, come on. They could have at least titled it Super Mario Galaxy Wii. Oh, that would have been better. <laughs> There was an eShop release on Wii U. Uh, That was in North America on Christmas Eve, December 24th of 2015. Found that interesting. And then most recently, China got a version of the game on NVIDIA Shield. So an Android version on March 22nd, 2018. What? Yeah. It was that. And oh gosh, there were a couple other... Uh, games that like was like Twilight Princess, I think maybe it was like weird Nintendo games got ported to Nvidia Shield, so they were able to play Galaxy in widescreen 1080p HD, and it's like oh dang! In fact, that may have been the version that is put into Super Mario 3D All Stars, which is the collection of Super Mario 64, Sunshine, and Galaxy. Coming to Nintendo Switch this week, releasing September 18th, 2020, for a limited time. It's dumb that that's the case. Who knows if it'll be distributed in separate parts, separate game releases after March 31st, but that's probably why I'm getting the physical version, because if uh, Nintendo is even thinking about delisting a game of some of their biggest games of all time, from digital questions there. Super Mario Galaxy was developed by Nintendo EAD Tokyo and was published by Nintendo. It is a 3D platformer, as you might expect. In fact, it's the third 3D Mario platforming game after 1996's Super Mario 64 and 2002's Super Mario Sunshine. That makes sense why they're all bundled together in that 3D All-Stars game, though. Uh, Why Galaxy 2, the 2010 sequel, got shafted? Who knows? DLC, maybe? Does it get released separately after March 31st? I don't know. We'll have to see. But Super Mario Galaxy takes place in space. Who would have guessed? And there are newer platforming mechanics that are involved with that, including planetary physics and changes in gravity. Overall, you collect power stars through a variety of missions that are available in each galaxy. There are even colored comets that come by with Level mix-ups like do a speed run this quickly or here's a daredevil run where you can't get hit at all and there are no health healing things. 
Uh, you shake the Wii remote to give Mario an extra spin jump in midair, or he can spin attack on the ground. And you can point the Wii remote at the screen along with player two to collect different star bits that are throughout the different levels and build those up and use them, spend them like currency. The story of Super Mario Galaxy, it is the Centennial Star Festival in the Mushroom Kingdom. But shortly after Princess Peach invites Mario to this event, Bowser invades the kingdom in a fleet of airships, and he removes Peach's castle from its foundations and lifts it into outer space, taking Peach with him. In his rescue attempt, Mario is also launched into space, and he lands on a small planet. It's through these circumstances that Mario meets the Enchantress Rosalina and her star-shaped companions, the Lumas. Rosalina is a watcher of the stars who uses the Comet Observatory to travel across the universe. However, Bowser has stolen all of the power stars that act as the observatory's power source, rendering it immobile. Can Mario use power stars to make the observatory functional again? What is Rosalina's backstory? And can Mario rescue Princess Peach from Bowser? Joe, here's where I'll ask you, what are our experiences with Super Mario Galaxy? I got this game because it came with the Wii. Uh, obviously, I was planning on getting it anyways. I just wanted it because it was it was coming out around the time that I was starting to pay attention to gaming news. Uh, that was that was that era in in oh seven oh eight stuff like that. And so when we finally got a Wii, it was in a bundle with that Wii Play. And I think it might have just been those two games now that I think about it. Uh, Galaxy and Wii Play is a very weird combination of games to get with your Wii, but whatever. It's the first 3D Mario game I had played since playing 64 as a kid. I didn't have a GameCube, so I didn't play Sunshine ever. I still haven't played Sunshine, and eventually I will get to Sunshine on the 3D All-Stars collection, but that will be when we get to it for Smash Pieces, because I would rather that be my first trip through sunshine and also i have a feeling i'm not going to like sunshine very much uh <laughs> call me crazy i love mario galaxy it's great it is a great game it's got a great soundtrack i do agree with people that say galaxy 2 is a better game but i think in terms of plot and like having a narrative and stuff and in terms of just general setting like the combat observatory is such a cool level hub uh, there's not much to it, but it's just so nice. The music really helps with that, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll be real. And I don't know. I I uh, love Super Mario Galaxy. I haven't played it in years because I lent my copy to a friend and then never saw it again. Oh, no. I played it a couple years ago. Granted, it was a, a repeat playthrough. I love Super Mario Galaxy. It was my very first Mario game that I owned and played all the way through. Uh, uh, there's something special about it, for sure. And I agree with you. Uh, you know, Galaxy 2 adds more, and it, it can be seen as a better game, but there's something so charming about the original. Uh, meeting Rosalina for the first time, her being a prominent character when she wouldn't be in Galaxy 2 would be Lubba. And everybody loves Lubba, right? No. That's that's my script for my new sitcom. Everybody loves Lubba. <laughs> He's a purple Luma who's just gotten a little too big for his britches. He's just Grimace, but a Luma. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he is. Uh, but yeah, I, I love Super Mario Galaxy. And I think it arguably has one of the best soundtracks Nintendo has ever made. Like, an orchestral soundtrack. People can say, like, oh, Smash Brothers, it's such a big accomplishment collected from uh, Nintendo games all across history. Yes, fine. But as far as, like, a single work of art for a, a singular soundtrack designed for a single game, Mario Galaxy's up there. It's really, really impressive. So, Nintendo EAD Tokyo was coming off of Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, working on that game in 2004. And there was a push within Nintendo to realize a concept that was shown off in Super Mario 128, which was a tech demo that was shown at Nintendo Space World in 2000. And it was to 
exemplify the processing power of the Nintendo GameCube. But this concept was spherical worlds. It was originally considered impossible at the time for technical reasons. Yet a prototype was worked up in about three months with many of the core ideas kind of in place in this prototype before even the development of the Nintendo Wii console began. But as the developers continued working on the game, building out that prototype into an actual game, there was still a lot of skepticism. And yet it resulted in play that the developers felt was totally fresh and that it was, quote, like nothing that's come before it. And yet they're kind of right. Those planet platforming sections where you're running around this spherical object, pretty unique, not going to lie. Nobody plays Mario Galaxy for the first time and doesn't have to, like, get used to the idea of the the spherical worlds. Because it's really disorienting at first. Mm -hmm. Like, crazy disorienting. Uh, But then, eventually, it just sort of clicks and you get used to it and it feels real natural. It does feel really good. The idea of Mario having a spin attack, this was in the game's design early on for a couple reasons because of 3D space. One of them was that Mario needed an attack on the ground that had some good range to it, not just punches and kicks. Also because jumping on enemies in that 3D spherical space was really new and different and might take new players you know, some time to get used to. So give Mario a big kind of AoE attack, like a spin attack, yeah, do that, that makes sense. But also jumping, doing longer jumps in that 3D spherical space you may need a course correct option, and that's definitely what the spin jump allows for. The original idea, though, had the spin initially activated via rotating the nunchuck's control stick. But after motion sensing was to be confirmed to be inside the Wii remote, the spin changed to being activated by shaking the remote. Uh, Fortunately, as we see from that NVIDIA Shield version in China and transferred into the upcoming Switch version, uh, this is just turned into a button press. Thank goodness. But yeah, wow, I can't imagine something as important as the spin jump being done by spinning the analog stick. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that seems way, way too slow. There's no way. Like, you need to do that at a dime's like drop. It needs to be immediate, so... That's why Shaking worked really well, actually. It's it's one of the only games I can think of where one of the central mechanics was built into Shaking the Wii Remote. Because, like, Donkey Kong Country Returns tried that as well. And uh, that's why the 3DS version is better. Mm-hmm. Galaxy, Galaxy did it perfectly. Shaking that stick, like, just real fast. Immediately makes you do the spin. Works super well for, like you mentioned, the the course correction that sometimes you really do need in this game. Mm -hmm. There are more transformations in this game, a couple new ones for for Mario. Uh, But it is important to note that, quote, one of the female members of the staff who worked on Super Mario Galaxy wrote a note saying, quote, I want a bee Mario. When asked by Yoshiaki Koizumi, the the director of the game, what they wanted to transform Mario into. And that woman is a hero. I hate bees myself, but bee Mario works out pretty well in this game. Uh, Other transformations would include boo, spring, fire, ice, rainbow, and flying Mario. The team wanted players from, quote, 5 to 95 to be able to play and enjoy the game. But after Shigeru Miyamoto thought that the game was too easy, Mario's health bar was adjusted from 8 in Super Mario 64 and Sunshine to 3. Though fortunately, more checkpoints, coins, and 1-ups were placed throughout the galaxies to kind of counterbalance the difficulty a little bit there. I never had an issue with difficulty because of those things, but uh, that is interesting to note that like the health bar for Mario changed so drastically. Yeah, that's a Big change. I'd never thought about that, actually. That makes a lot more sense now. There are a couple interesting little trivia tidbits here for Super Mario Galaxy. Uh, 16 years before its release, and totally by coincidence, the title Super Mario Galaxy was first mentioned in a fan letter written to Nintendo Power 
by Jimmy Peterford of Glen Cove, New York. The letter in question, which was printed in the December 1991 issue, detailed a fantasy game system called the Raw Power System, which would come bundled with a game called Super Mario Galaxy, but in Peterford's words, would be, quote, better known as Super Mario Bros. 24. What? In case you ever wanted to know where Super Mario Galaxy may have first appeared by chance. Alrighty. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Galaxy image in the Super Mario Galaxy title is an edited version of the photograph that Robert Gendler took of the Andromeda Galaxy in 2005. This title is infamous for having little sparkles by the letters U-R-M-R-G-A-Y, or as it's been referred to throughout the years, you are Mr. Gay. As noted by Aaron Hansen of Game Grumps, the sparkles in Super Mario Galaxy 2's logo spell out Y-A-I-M-R-U, or Ya-I-M-R-U, when reversed. <sighs> they changed the, the logo at some point, didn't they? I think for later releases, they got rid of the sparkles or put them on different letters, I'm pretty sure. Well, I don't know, Joe. Looking at the Super Mario 3D AllStars.Nintendo.com website, that logo does say you are Mr. Gay for those sparkles. Well, they didn't back down then, and I'm proud of them for that. Ultimately, as EAD Tokyo was pressured to finish the game as close to Wii's launch as possible, as several executives were disappointed by Super Mario Sunshine not being a GameCube launch title and thought that maybe an earlier release of that would have helped GameCube's poor commercial performance. Instead, EAD Tokyo just said, now we're going to make a polished Mario game and that's more important. As sure it was, because we have a new top game for a highest reviewed game on original sound chat. Super Mario Galaxy... It was reviewed incredibly well. It is the fifth highest reviewed game on Metacritic with a 97. On Metacritic's overall rankings, it only sits behind The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, Grand Theft Auto 4, and the original Soul Calibur. It is the highest reviewed game on game rankings at a 98%. If anything, because there were so many positives, Critiques included a spotty camera, a, quote, complete disinterest in telling a compelling story, and a lack of voice acting, which, um, all of those critiques leave something to be desired, because let's be honest, the camera is amazing, all things considered when you're going around all these planets. The storytelling has one of the most effective Mario storytelling devices in Rosalina's storybook. Granted, the overall plot is a Mario game. It's not going to have much of a plot. And lack of voice acting, what the hell are you talking about? But Peter Sunshine had vo full voice acting, and it was so good. Oh, it was so missed in Galaxy. No, no, come on, let, let's be honest. By the end of March 2020, Nintendo had sold 12.80 million copies of the game worldwide, making it the third best-selling non-bundled Wii game and the ninth best-selling Nintendo-published game for the Wii. It won Game of the Year from the BAFTAs, IGN, GameSpot, Game Trailers, Edge, Nintendo Power, uh, surprise, Kotaku, and Yahoo Games. And this is for games released in 2007. 2007 is a legendary year of video game releases. You're talking... Bioshock, you're talking Portal and the rest of the Orange Box, Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare, Halo 3, Mass Effect, Rock Band, Guitar Hero, the original Uncharted, like, for Super Mario Galaxy to win that many Game of the Year awards amongst, I mean, God, Bioshock for one was another huge winner of Game of the Year for that year. That's impressive. Yeah, that's, uh, oh man, I feel like 2007 is one of those years we keep coming back to. To tell people like, hey, this was a that was a good year. No, we're not kidding. That was a really good year. It was 98, 2007, 2017. And then and sometimes 2018 sneaks in there. But like those are the usually seen as like the seminal years of game releases. 
But anyway, as far as Super Mario Galaxy's legacy, it had its sequel in 2010 of Super Mario Galaxy 2. The game was originally planned as Super Mario Galaxy More, which that sure is a Nintendo title if I ever saw one. Uh, Rosalina and other different stages, galaxies, music uh, would have prominent places. She became a prominent princess-like character, Rosalina did, uh, overall in the Mario universe and was featured in Super Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, Mario Party. She was a secret unlockable character in Super Mario 3D World. And it goes on and on and on. It, it's an important game in the Mario 3D platforming lineage, just the Mario lineage in general. When it comes to the soundtrack for Super Mario Galaxy, though, it is primarily driven by Mahito Yokota. And speaking of Super Mario 3D World, we brought that game to the show on Original Sound Chat, and we talked about Mahito Yokota there. That's who we profiled. Well, also, Koji Kondo was the sound supervisor. He contributed four tracks to the soundtrack, but we talked about him when we talked about Super Mario 64. So, uh, who could we talk about? We're going to talk about Ryo Nagamatsu, because it feels like we've mentioned his name quite a lot in different places on this show before, but also he contributed tracks to Super Mario Galaxy 2. And it was our way of like getting to talk about this game finally, because it's, it's one of the all-time greats, uh, but also to try to fit in a name tangentially here. Not much information, though, on Ryo Nagamatsu. Uh, being a current Nintendo composer, doesn't have much online presence as far as telling a biography or things like that. Ryo Nagamatsu is born on October 25th, 1982 in Sasebo, Nagasaki Prefecture in Japan. He's been with Nintendo since 2006 as a composer. He is the expert staff ghost for Wario's Goldmine in Mario Kart Wii. And you can follow him on Twitter at Nagamatsu Ryo. What a weirdly specific fact about the Mario Kart thing. Yeah, and he's also credited as character voices in Mario Party Star Rush and Super Mario Party, but they don't say for which character. So, like, I wonder if his voices lent to some minor Nintendo character. Like, I, I don't know. Hard to say. Was not present in different fan wikis because he doesn't even have a main Wikipedia page. The games that Ryo Nagamatsu has worked on include We Play, Big Brain Academy, We Degree. Mario Kart Wii, Wii Sports Resort, New Super Mario Bros. Wii, Super Mario Galaxy 2, Nintendo Land, The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds, Mario Kart 8, The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes, Splatoon 2, and The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. He seemed to be like the big composer behind the recent Link's Awakening Switch uh, remake. So that would be your, his most recent work, I suppose. Also, we like to talk about when Nintendo composers work on Smash Brothers arrangements in the 3DS Wii U version, he's credited with credits Smash Bros. version 2 and Ballad of the Goddess Girahim's theme from The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. In Ultimate, he arranged Nintendo Switch Presentation 2017 trailer BGM, which comes from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and the Find Me, Find Me 2 medley. As far as historical development research on Super Mario Galaxy, Really, it is about Mahito Yokota being that lead composer. And he originally envisioned the game having a Latin American styled score. And he even composed 28 tracks with this in mind, including using Latin instruments and synthesizers to create old timey science fiction sounds for the title screen. So I guess that's another theme is that totally different genres were imagined at first. For these soundtracks, but uh, yeah, it did not end up that way. That sort of makes sense for Mario almost, though, because Koji Kondo likes to talk about how the original Mario Brothers theme was meant to be in that style. That was what he was picturing when he when he put it together. It's supposed to have a sort of Latin flair to it, hmm. and I've never really heard that, but I'm not going to argue with Koji Kondo about what the song was supposed to be. <laughs> right, right. Well... We, I believe we've shared this story before in the Super Mario 3D World uh, episode because it's, it's such a great story with, uh, with Yokota. So that original composition 
with the the Latin instruments and old timey science fiction sounds and all that. Uh, it was overall approved by Yoshiaki Koizumi, the game's director and designer. But when Yokota presented it to Koji Kondo, Kondo stated that it was no good. When he was asked why his music was rejected, Kondo responded, If somewhere in your mind you have an image that Mario is cute, please get rid of it. All right, I think I do remember that coming up during it. So Yokota was so incensed by this rejection that he almost resigned from his job. But Kondo implied that Mario's character was cool and instructed him to try again. Three months later, Yokota presented three different styles of music to Shigeru Miyamoto. One piece had an orchestral sound, the other with a little more pop music, and the last featured a mix of both orchestral and pop. Miyamoto chose the orchestral piece, as it sounded the most space-like. Yokota stated that Miyamoto chose the piece without knowing that it was Kondo who actually wrote it. Ooh, (laughs) unfortunate. Ow. Ultimately, they got to work with this orchestral style in mind, and 28 orchestral songs were performed by a 50-person symphony orchestra. It is interesting that I'm following this game up while talking about Star Fox Assault last week, and we're like, Star Fox Assault had an orchestrated soundtrack? But but I thought that honor went to Super Mario Galaxy, and obviously you can tell with Galaxy because there's more space on a DVD for the Wii. They don't have to compress the sound as much. It actually sounds like an amazing orchestra. I mean, that that much is clear, but I promise that it just so happened to work out that way. Thank you, Mario 3D All-Stars release date. Yeah, this was not actually the planned game for this week. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes you gotta make an audible. Yokota initially had concerns whether or not this orchestral music would fit in with the rhythm of a Mario game, but he thought that this kind of music would also make the scale of the game, quote, seem more epic. Kondo, on the other hand, believed if orchestral music were used, the player would be, quote, obligated to play the game in time to the music. Not once have I thought this ever. I mean, the closest I can think of ever doing that in a Mario game in general is jumping along to the the rhythm of Rogueport in Thousand Year Door, but I cannot ever say that I did that in Galaxy at any point. <laughs> Right. Well, to synchronize this orchestrated soundtrack to the gameplay, sound director Masafumi Kawamura utilized similar techniques that he used to synchronize sound effects in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker and Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, in which, now now bear with me here, we may get a little technical, in which the game synchronizes MIDI data with streaming data, resulting in sound effects playing at the same time as the background music. To make this synchronization possible, the audio team requested that the orchestra performed at different tempos set with a metronome. I've never noticed this. Uh, You could have, you know, never told me this and I would have been none the wiser. I don't see how this really made that big of an impact in Super Mario Galaxy, but okay. Yeah, I don't, I can't think of, again, it's been years since I played. Maybe I'll notice it now when I replay it. I don't know. Maybe. And maybe if you're playing at home in the 3D All-Stars collection, just, just let us know. But ultimately, this soundtrack was such a big deal and just a a huge accomplishment that it eventually became available as a Club Nintendo reward. At first in an original soundtrack form with 28 tracks and later in a platinum edition with 81 tracks. In North America, the original soundtrack was included in a Wii console bundle alongside New Super Mario Bros. Wii in 2011. They bundled the soundtrack in with a console. That's how good this is. Just saying. I wish I would have gotten that one. I've never owned this soundtrack physically. And like, what this says to me is Nintendo knows there's a market for these things. And yet, it's rare that we get a full official soundtrack release for any of these that leave Japan. Ever. Much less on streaming platforms. Yeah, like, come on. Y'all know people want them. You bundled it with a Wii. (sighs) Let's get to this amazing soundtrack, though. Let's go into the five critical tracks for Super Mario Galaxy. We have to start with Egg Planet.
No, this isn't the final level in a Sonic game where Dr. Eggman is retreated to his planet. It's just the title for the piece that is used in the Good Egg Galaxy, which is the very first big galaxy in the game. Yeah, there are a couple introductory levels, but when the game is really setting you free and allowing you to explore with the physics at play and you know try to complete a task to get a power star, it's the Good Egg Galaxy. It's this song composed by Koji Kondo. And I think it's just the perfect musical introduction to opening up the scale of the game. Anything is possible. The orchestration is amazing. In the middle of the piece, it's not in the clip, but you get this flute solo that is just like, oh, yes, this is real instruments at work. It's such a fantastic opening level piece. I agree, and I don't really think there's much more that needs to be said other than this song is an immediate introduction to this is what Mario Galaxy is going to sound like. Like It's not the first song you hear, but it essentially might as well be. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And also, Good Egg Galaxy is mean because it shakes the carrot of Yoshi? But no, Yoshi's not in this game. <laughs> He'll be in the next one. It's okay. Another classic had to be here piece is number two on the Critical Five. This is Rosalina in the Observatory 3. Little Loki, stop chewing your bone against the base of the chair, because it's really loud. Also composed by the legendary Koji Kondo, it's that hub world. We talked about the Comet Observatory and how it's such a good hub world. Uh, you get to jump and explore and not have any penalty of falling. And just whoa, 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 as you get saved and plopped back on the platform you build up the observatory unlock more power stars more power to the observatory more levels to the observatory and as a result the track for this uh rosalina in the observatory builds instruments there are three versions this is the ultimate final version that this song gets to it starts really simple and then uh, just a grand orchestration here. A beautiful waltz. Just really great here. Uh, this one is definitive for the original Galaxy. Always in my head when I think about this game. And it's a must. Had to be here. I think this is the best hub world music in the Mario series. Just in general. Like uh, Odyssey doesn't really have one. Uh, Delfino Plaza is very, very good, and Peach's Castle is iconic, but I think this one beats them all out overall. I have a weak spot for waltzes in the first place. Waltzes are great. Uh, you give me anything with a with a three four, and I'm I'm in. Uh, <laughs> it's just such a good melody. This is one of those songs where I was like, I wish that I could have gotten my my high school orchestra to play this song, but alas. Was not in the cards. Oh, that would have been perfect. I would have loved to see that and hear that for sure. Number three on the critical five. Another one that I just, I'd love, had to be here. This is Space Junk Road. So this is the level, I think it's in the second batch of galaxies, where it's Space Junk Galaxy. 
You're doing a lot of floating. You're pulling Mario through the level with these pull stars. And it's just this beautiful, ethereal piano piece. You're getting some synth sounds that sound a little bit spacey in there. Uh, I think it's it's just a really calm piece. You know, you don't get like the full orchestration in this one, but it's nice to know that they can kind of show the other end of the spectrum here. And this one has just always caught my ear as just this gorgeous piece. We're both suckers for piano, let's be honest. Uh, this one is, uh, it's not as much of a must as some of these, but it's a personal choice. And I feel like anyone who's played this game knows the song well. I think this was a good pick just for something that really has the space-like feeling that Galaxy's soundtrack tries to really pull out. Because this one, it sounds like space. Personally, I think one of your cutting room four tracks I would have put in place of it. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue against it uh being mentioned here at all. I think this is, is definitely a song that overall does deserve recognition. It's it's very good and the level is always very memorable with the the paths building themselves in front of you and all that. Yeah, no, it's it's a great one. I definitely for that quieter end of the spectrum. As far as the most famous song to come from this game, I would say it's number four here on the Critical Five. This is Gusty Garden Galaxy. The level itself, not all that memorable or great. You got the dandelions that you can spin on to get some air, and once you do some more spins, it like loses the petals of the dandelion fly. It's it's not the best level, but it's an incredible composition from Mahito Yokota here. I would say if it's not the most famous piece from this game, it's at least widely acknowledged by fans, most people, to just be the best piece in the game. There are these two main melodies in the piece. One of them you hear prominently in the clip that we played. Uh, the other one, I feel like gets used pretty widely to represent Super Mario Galaxy with a da 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 um, You hear that motif come back in, we've talked about, Cloud Top Cruise in Mario Kart 8. So that's that's where that comes back in. So it's just a phenomenal piece where two melodies kind of define it overall. And it, again, is once again, that grand orchestral sound that works so well in this game. I don't know if I'd agree that this is the most famous piece in the game. I think that goes to the observatory music, personally. Uh, if I had to say, like, one that I hear talked about the most. But I will agree that, yes, uh, this is widely considered, like, the best song in the game. I really like that guitar part Ooh, yeah. in the background. It it just really gives this piece a good a good sense of movement, I think. Uh, that's that's what always stands out to me the most for, for Gusty Garden. I agree. Wrapping up the Critical Five, this is the Galaxy Reactor. So this is from the final level of the game. And I like this in a way because of what it's not, if that makes sense. It's a great piece on its own, but I don't know if you would have necessarily identified it as like, oh yeah, this is so fitting of a final level. It's It certainly has the driven pace to it, but if you're like, oh, we're in Bowser's galaxy, like you could have amped up the big 
orchestral swells and the evil sounding epic theming, but no, like it still has some some space like sounds and it has a good you know string orchestration to it. But overall, I, I think it's just a piece that wraps up the experience nicely and it's like you're pushing towards something at the end of the game. I agree that it would kind of lose something by sounding a little more epic than it than it is. I think it has a good tension to it though. Where it's it's not too evil sounding, but I remember the Galaxy Reactor being a pretty good challenge and like pr- a pretty fun final level to be perfectly honest. And this this song does usually spring to mind when I think about it. On the cutting room floor, we both have two tracks. Joe, hit me with yours. So my first track is Battle Rock Galaxy. I don't know, I've always kind of had a, a soft spot both for this song and for this world. Like, I, I always remember those... I think it's something to do with the texture of those discs. Mm. Of the, like, the like really, really smooth chrome texture. It's really satisfying to look at. Uh, but this song has always had the, the sort of feeling of a building space battle that's about to start. And, I don't know, I've always kind of dug that a lot. It's definitely up there as far as, like, the better tracks in the game. I'm glad you mentioned it here on the cutting room floor. It was tough to leave off the Critical 5, for sure. And for my second track on the cutting room floor, it's Purple Comet. I know this one's just kind of a personal choice. I really, really dig this song a lot. I never liked the purple coin stuff. I never did like any of it. They're not fun. Uh, I don't enjoy having to track down, what is it, 50 purple coins in levels or something? Oh, it might be 100. Might be 100. I think my, my biggest complaint about Mario Galaxy, my only real criticism, is I don't like how the... Uh, no... I'm thinking of Mario Galaxy 2. Never mind. I was going to say, I don't like how the comets work, but I'm pretty sure I'm thinking of Galaxy 2, where they're slightly changed and worse. I mean, they're not great in Galaxy, to be fair. Yeah. (laughs) It's one of those things where it's like, I've never gotten the 120 stars to unlock Luigi, and then you do everything with Luigi, and get like, I've only done generally what I've needed to and, and loved it, to be honest. But yeah, to complete it sounds tough for some of them, for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, screw Shadow Mario races. They are dumb. I don't remember which ones I hate the most, but yeah, I'm pretty sure Shadow Mario races are up there. (laughs) When it comes to my tracks on the cutting room floor, one that sticks out for me is Beach Bowl Galaxy. Just everything about this piece is exactly what I think of when I think of beach level. It's this song precisely. Like it's happy, tropical. They picked the instruments perfectly and the performances are great. And it's just a nice, tight, rhythmic piece. Great setting. When I think of beach levels, I kind of have a mix of this and uh, Destiny Islands. Those are the two that, that come to mind for me. Oh, sure. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. This one was so hard to leave off the Critical Five, and this is the one you're referring to. The other one on my cutting room floor is King Bowser.
This isn't the final boss fight theme. It's like the first two that you fight against Bowser. But boy, does it have that epic scale. Makes some people think of the PS2 God of War games. I don't know, like that's, if you hear this instrumentation, you could definitely think that. Uh, the YouTube commenters certainly like to think that the chorus is saying, Soap, 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 soap. Which it could be, I'm sure there it's, you know, some, some Latin thing, or maybe it's a Japanese word or whatever, but yeah. Uh, give give Mario a bath with some soap, 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 soap. You are correct. This is exactly the one I was referring to when I said this is the one I would put up in the Critical Five. And I actually didn't realize that was the case until listening back while planning for this episode, because it's been a really long time since I sat down and listened to this soundtrack. This might be my favorite Bowser fight music ever. Yeah. It's so good. It makes Bowser feel like such a threat. Mm -hmm. Also, shouts out to the storybook theme. Real hard to even leave off the cutting room floor. I'm so sorry. That mm -hmm. uh, tugs at the heartstrings. I also really dig the final boss. Uh, and uh, Bowser Jr.'s theme has always had a thing. Oh, yeah. In my, like, been an earworm for me for years. But alas, we only get so many tracks. Yeah, that's a good point. Da 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 da. That's that's a good one too. What will I never forget about Super Mario Galaxy? Like you mentioned, this is around a time where, like, I was really opening my eyes to game news and all that, and I I got a Wii as the first console I bought with my own. Well. I, the GameCube I split with my brother, and that was our first console. But I was at college when we came out, and so that was the first console I solely bought with my own money. And when Super Mario Galaxy came out, it was a combination of the reviews. Oh, I know Mario's got such a, a great legacy, and obviously, I mean, he's, he's a very, very famous character. But I've never bought and played a Mario game fully, and what a, a one to start with. It's going to be real tempting for me not to just go back and play 3D All-Stars and start with Galaxy again, even though I played it a couple of years ago. Granted, I have only played so much of 64, but never to completion. I've never played Sunshine, and I love, love, love Super Mario Galaxy. I'm actually looking forward to showing the game to my girlfriend. It's, uh, it's a fantastic game, and I think very highly of it. Part of me is absolutely terrified to say I'm looking forward to replaying it on 3D All-Stars, because remember what happened last time I said I was looking forward to playing a re-release of a game on this show? That was Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, and then two days later, it came out that that game, that remaster, was trash. Oh no. Uh, I hope that's not the case this time. I doubt it is. That Nintendo at least makes sure their games function correctly before they re-release them most of the time. They have a pretty good track record on that, as far as I remember. Uh, I am probably going to replay Galaxy at some point. I'm going to replay 64 first, just to see, hey, did what What all is uh, different? Let's see. Um, very little will be, but I love Mario 64 anyways, so who cares? And then I'm probably going to replay Galaxy, because we're not going to hit it on Smash to Pieces for a very long time, and I want to replay it. And I can't play Sunshine yet. And again, pretty sure I'm not gonna like Sunshine. So, yeah, I I adore this game, but I think the soundtrack is squarely the thing I will never forget about it. Oh, oh, for sure. I'm really excited for everyone who gets to experience Super Mario Galaxy for the first time. Like, soak that in and enjoy it. It's it is definitely unlike anything. But as far as celestial beings and objects in games. Sayonara Wild Hearts, Super Mario Galaxy, a great week of soundtracks on this podcast. That'll do it for us this week on Original Sound Chat. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at The Dobaga. The video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, also at rhymeswithasia.com. But it's that MP3 podcast that you want, hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. That is also where... Joe's other podcast that he hosts with our friend Matt 
Smaster Pieces is also on and on Dino. Those podcasts can be found on podcast storefronts all around the globe. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, YouTube Music, I don't know, whatever it's called now, and even Spotify. Spotify has the podcast feed with episodes and bonus tracks, but it also has the Spotify playlist that builds when we talk about video game tracks on this show, and they're on Spotify. Uh, Super Mario Galaxy is a Nintendo game, so it's not there. Are we adding more songs from Sayonara Wild Hearts this week, Joe? We sure are, though all the Critical Five are already on there because of the best of 2019, but we get to fill in some of the honorable, or the cutting room floor tracks, so that's good. Excellent. Good to hear. As far as bonus tracks goes, 2017 is in production. That's a hell of a top 10 for best of 2017, not gonna lie, it's a big one. I want to plug real quick, uh, I am going to be experimenting with a new streaming block on Nintendo World Report. By the time you hear this, I've already tried the quote-unquote pilot episode. Uh, It would have been on Katamari Damashi, where I'm just going to sit down and play a game where I really like the soundtrack, and we're going to talk about the soundtrack while we play, specifically focusing on the song that is playing during that section. I don't know how well it's going to work. You can go watch the VOD of that one if you want to see how that turned out. I'm hoping to do it on Saturday evenings, so please look forward to that. If you like this show, I'm kind of hoping it'll be something in a similar vein, uh, and you might enjoy that block as well. That's a really good idea and uh, a great game to start that with. Joe, who are we talking about next week? I will be talking about Klaus Wien. I will be talking about Junichi Nakatsuru. Hmm, should be an interesting pair of games there. Well, to play us out, I gotta go back to Smooth McGroove. It's been a long time since we've had Smooth McGroove covers on this show, but when it comes to Gusty Garden Galaxy from Super Mario Galaxy, yeah, I gotta have Smooth McGroove wrapping up the show. Perfect fit. Thank you so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care.